virtual and live audience. Our speaker will present for approximately 40 to 45 minutes, and we'll leave 15 minutes at the end for question and answer. For our virtual audience, through the presentation, please use the Q&A feature. I think you probably should be very familiar with that now. At the bottom of your screen, not in the chat, to submit the questions. And we will answer as many as questions as possible during the question and answer sessions at the end. For our live audience, uh, you have the chance to ask a question during the Q&A session as well. So now, today it's really my honor and the pleasure to welcome Professor uh, Katharina Mazel. Uh, Dr. Mazel joined the University of Maryland in January 2019, a year before the COVID. So uh, I'm pretty sure that's a really interesting experience. And every one of them struggled, and especially during faculty. And her interdisciplinary training includes the fields of nanotechnology, material science, mucosal immunology, lymphatic immunology, and uh, immunoengineering. Dr. Mazel has won a number of awards, including the NSF uh, Graduate Fellowship, NHF 32 Fellowship as a trainee, and the American Law Association uh, Desimer Award, LIM uh, Foundation Career Development Award, NSF Career Award, and NIH uh, Maximize, NIGMS Maximize Investment Research Award. Her work have led to uh, numerous high impact publications, particularly in the field of drug delivery and mucosa and lymphatic immune, uh, immunoengineering and several patterns. So let's give us a welcome to Professor Basil. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Yes. Get the sharing set up as well. So thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's my pleasure to be here and share some of the work from my lab with all of you. Um, so I'm gonna just wait for a second so you can actually see you know the slides. Um, but essentially, my lab is really interested in both figuring out how to cross and then also probe biological barriers. Um, all right, awesome. No, just presentation. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. All right. So um, I usually like to start with just a little bit about me um, so that especially the trainees in the room feel a little more comfortable asking questions, knowing a little bit more about me as a person. Um, so I did my bachelor's in material science and engineering at the University of Michigan. And I actually immigrated to Michigan from Germany um, when I was 13 years old. Uh, so this is where I'm actually originally from. So I'm from central Bavaria. Um, the what? So, oh, okay. I will mm, mm, share. This one. Yeah. There you go. Okay. There we go. Cool. Sure. Um, so I grew up in central Bavaria um, and I, uh, well, yeah, we moved to, to Michigan um, when I was 13. So I did high school and college in Michigan. Then I went and did my PhD at Hopkins. Um, so not too far from where I am now. Did a postdoc at UChicago and then came back to Maryland and I'm now a faculty there. I have a lovely cat that has uh, been with me through a lot of this journal journey. So he's an old man at this point. He's about 15 years old. Um, I love to bake. I like ice cream. I like hiking. I like biking. So if you know you're uh, thinking I'm just you know this professor that's somewhere out there in the world, I'm also just a normal person. So please uh, ask questions. Feel free to interrupt with questions as well, and I'll try to repeat them on the mic so people on Zoom can also hear. Um, so uh, yeah, just trainees, please, please, please ask. Um, I'm very happy to answer all of your questions. So like I said, my lab really is interested in barriers and we're particularly interested in mucosal tissue barriers. So in the mucosal surfaces, um, you have a number of different barriers. So we've got, uh, I guess I we'll call them acellular barriers. So we've got mucus that is on the surface of the epithelium um, that essentially is a porous gel filtration system to trap pathogens and particulates from getting into the body. It's really your, part of your first line of defense. And then also all the way underneath the, inter, the epithelial surface, we have the interstitium. So this is kind of the space in between the cells within the tissue. We've also got some cellular barriers 
to the epithelium itself, as well as the lymphatics. So my lab is, is really interested in trying to understand lymphatic transport and, and studying how do we overcome some of these barriers? How do we get past interstitial tissue? How do we get materials into lymphatic vessels? And I'll talk about why we want to do that in a second. Um, and then also we're really interested in trying to build some better in vitro models so that we can study mucosal epithelial and, and uh, mucus barriers. So I'm going to try and we'll see how we do on time, whether or not I get to all of three, these three, but I'm going to try to talk about um, our work on nanoparticle systems to target lymphatic transport, uh, also nanoparticle systems on crossing interstitial uh, tissue barriers within the lymph node, and then lastly, designing a mucus producing gut in vitro model. And you'll notice a the theme here, using nanoparticles to characterize the mucus. So we work a lot with nanoparticles, both as a drug delivery vehicle, and then also to actually study these biological barriers. So this first project was led by Jake McWright, who's um, actually about to graduate. Um, so he's the first PhD student that joined my group, and he was really interested in some of this work on lymphatics. And so lymphatics are really crucial for tissue homeostasis. They're essentially part of your circulatory system, even though we don't really talk about them as that. They're kind of, you can think of them like a sidearm of the circulatory system. So when you have uh, blood going into your peripheral tissue, in those tissues, you're going to have fluid accumulating, and some of that fluid will get drained into lymphatics lymphatic vessels. And those vessels transport fluid as well as cells and other materials to the lymph nodes where your adaptive immune response is shaped. And so this leads to the lymphatics having a really crucial role in modulating immunity. And so this is part of the reason why we're really interested in trying to understand how do we get things into lymphatics so that we can then actually get them to the lymph nodes. And one of the things that has been shown probably for about two decades now is that one of the things that gets into lymphatics is particulates. So in particular, particulates of about 10 to 200, 250 nanometers in size, preferentially transport into lymphatic vessels over blood capillaries. So if you inject a particle, like actually your COVID vaccines, those were nanoparticles. And it's very likely that one of the reasons why they work quite well is that they actually transported that vaccine from that peripheral injection site to the local lymph nodes. And so lymph node delivery of immune modulatory agents like vaccines has actually been shown to improve their efficacy. So, you know, if you're talking vaccines, has been also to some degree shown for allergen immunotherapy, cancer immunotherapy, tolerogenic treatments for autoimmunity. So there's really a vast array of applications that you can imagine by targeting lymphatic transport and kind of taking advantage of what the body is already doing. Right? This is a normal phenomenon, transport to the, via the lymphatics happens all the time. So as I'm moving here, your muscle movements will actually cause things to get transported into lymphatic vessels. And so one of the things that we were really interested in is not just figuring out the size, but my background is actually material science engineering. So we started asking this question of, okay, well, size is one thing, but what material properties, what surface chemistry is needed? What about shape? What about surface charge? How do all of those things actually affect nanoparticle transport into lymphatic vessels? And so this was the very first project in my lab that we started on, um, which turned out to actually be quite interesting and is really kind of the central project of uh, Jake's uh, PhD thesis. And so we started out with just making an array of particles. So we use polystyrene beads. They're just really easy to work with, to functionalize. They're standardized in terms of size. So you can modify them with things like polyethylene glycol, everyone's uh, favorite polymer. Um, and so we coated those particles with polyethylene glycol, either that has no charge or that has an N group of a carboxyl, so a negative charge, um, or an amine, so you can have a positively charged particle, so that way you can actually get charge on the surface, um, as well as having a coating that's kind of known as a, the stealth coating. And so we made this array of particles around 100 nanometers in size. They were quite similar in the size once we add the peg, right? So you can see um, 
a slight increase maybe, but not really much difference between the different functionalized uh, PEG versions. But you can appreciate that the surface chemistry really does affect the charge of the particle. So this is the zeta potential of those particles. So these are your neutrally charged methoxy N groups, negatively charged carboxyl, and then positively charged amine N groups. So you can really make an array of particles with different surface chemistries. And so to test whether or not these particles can get across lymphatic vessels, we started out with an in vitro model system. So this is a system that was actually developed by another grad student in my postdoc lab, where essentially you take lymphatic endothelial cells and you culture them on the bottom of a trans well. And you do that because we're trying to simulate transport into the lymphatic vessel, right? Normally when you're thinking about blood vessels and transport, um, via blood circulation, you're thinking about transport out of the vessel, but here, right, you're trying to get to the lymph nodes, you're trying to get into the vessel. So we've got our lymphatic endothelial cell monolayer on the bottom here, and then we can put our nanoparticles or other materials of interest on top and actually just sample on the bottom over time to try to understand how are they transported across. So we can confirm we've got a nice monolayer, um, so we're not just getting transport across because there's gaps between the cells. This is actually uh, paracellular and transcellular transport that's happening. And what you can appreciate is that adding um, charge really has differential effects on the transport of those particles. So if you're looking at these uh, at NPEGs, so those are the amine terminated um, PEG peg coated particles, these are not transported very effectively, but when you have a negative charge and even more so when you have a neutral charge, you get quite a bit of transport across lymphatic endothelial cells. And so knowing this and with some of the work that I had done on trying to understand how to get nanoparticles past the mucus barrier, we started also asking, okay, charge is one thing, and PEG is one of those things that has been used a lot already in the literature, but how much PEG do you need? Do you need a lot of PEG? Is a little bit of PEG enough? Um, so we started making particles with different densities of PEG on the surface. And so essentially, you know, this is a little bit of material science for you guys. Essentially, the, the way to measure this is the RF over DE. So RF is the flurry radius. So this is basically um, the space that the polymer would naturally take in solution without any constraints. And you divide it by D, which is the grafting distance between each of the polymers. And so that allows you to get sort of a, an estimate for what the conformation of PEG is on the particle surface. And so generally when you're talking about somewhere in the range of zero to one, one and a half, you're talking about this low density kind of mushroom conformation. And this is, these are just terms that were coined in the literature. You can have an intermediate brush that's somewhere between like one, one and a half to about three to four. And then once you get past an RF over D of four, you get a dense brush. So it's really just about the constraints. The more polymer you have on the surface, the more extended they're going to be because there's just more space constraints. And so we made a set of nanoparticles with um, more of the mushroom, the intermediate, and the dense peg conformation and actually just tested how well do they get through our lymphatic endothelial cell monolayer. So we did this for both 100 and 40 nanometer particles. We know those are sizes that really effectively get into lymphatic vessels based on the literature. Um, and we found really interestingly that in both cases, the densely pegylated particles actually maximize the transport across lymphatic endothelial cells in vitro. And that was true for both um, our 100 nanometer particles as well as our 40 nanometer particles. Not to say that PEG was helpful. Some PEG was definitely helpful. It just wasn't quite as good as when you have a dense layer of PEG. Now, of course, all of this is in vitro. Right, so we know in vitro doesn't always translate to in vivo. So we set out to do some just, you know, initial experiments trying to understand what happens when we inject this in mice. And so what we do is we do these intradermal injections on the front paws or front really arms um, of the mice and try to see, um, does it drain to the lymph node and look at lymph node accumulation as kind of a surrogate for lymphatic transport. And so you can appreciate here, these are just some examples um, at uh, the non-pegylated particles, you really don't see anything going to the lymph node. When you have the intermediate peg density, 
you do start seeing in some cases the particles start accumulating in the lymph node for some reason it's not always the case and it's not as much as uh, when you have the densely pegylated particles so that little dot that lights up that's basically the lymph node that's in the armpit of the mouse and so we sought to quantify that because, of course, you know, it's one thing to have an image. It's another thing to actually have some sort of quantitative analysis of what's going on here. And so we did both the distance from the injection point. So how far did the particles get? And then also actually the, the accumulation of the particles in the lymph node. And so you could see that in terms of distance from the injection point, our densely pegylated particles traveled the furthest. And in terms of lymph node accumulation, it was actually similar for the 100 nanometer particles, at least, uh, for both the densely pegylated and the um, intermediate pegylated particles. And when we did these same experiments with 40 nanometer particles, now we're actually seeing a difference also in terms of the lymph node accumulation. So there seems to be some um, size effect as well, where if you have a smaller particle, that dense peg layer becomes more important than when you have a larger particle. Now, this is all really interesting. We were pleased to see that this was actually confirmed in vivo. Um, so we started thinking a little bit more about how does this transport actually happen? And so trying to think about what are the cellular mechanisms that are actually driving the transport? And so just to give people a brief background on uh, cellular transport mechanisms, because I don't know how many of you are familiar with all of this. Um, and so there's two main avenues that things get transported across monolayers, so across things like a lymphatic vessel. Uh, one of them is paracellular transport, so this is in between the cells, and then also transcellular transport. There's a whole bunch of different pathways. I'll talk a little bit more about them in a second as well. Uh, but really, for transcellular transport, the first step is uptake, right? The particles need to be taken up by the cells and then trans and then they will be trans transcytosed um, to the other side. And so we, we first just asked, okay, well, does the surface chemistry actually affect trans uh, the uptake of the particles? Um, well, it didn't really affect the uptake. So what we found is that at least for 100 nanometer particles, uh, you can quite clearly see that it doesn't matter whether you're a polystyrene particle or you have some peg or a lot of peg, pretty much the same in terms of uptake. Uh, but we do see a difference in transport. So we started honing in on, okay, well, you know, are there any specific mechanisms that we can tease out? And so one of the things we were looking at is um, clathrin-mediated endocytosis is one of the things that's commonly um, used by cells to transport nanoparticles. And we really found that there does seem to be some clathrin-mediated endocytosis. So you can see the yellow in the overlay here is where you have your particles as well as the clathrin-coated vesicles. So it does seem to be clathrin-mediated uh, endocytosis as well. But you know, we did most of this with just our densely pegylated particles just to get a little bit of an understanding. So we really started asking, how does surface chemistry affect this mechanism? What about peg density? And so one of the ways that we can actually study this is by inhibiting some of those transport pathways. And so we uh, turn to small molecule inhibitors, uh, which one of them is amyloride. So amyloride inhibits macropinocytosis. Generally, we wouldn't assume that a particle that's that small gets transported by macropinocytosis, um, but you know, it's good to, to check everything that's possible. Then dinosaur inhibits dynamin-dependent endocytosis. So this is most of your micropinocytosis. We also used adrenomedulin, um, and adrenomedulin essentially tightens uh, or strengthens the tight junctions. You have less transport that goes between the cells. And so for each of these, when we applied that small molecule inhibitor, you could see that um, with dinosaur, so with um, the micropinocytosis, as well as paracellular transport with the adrenomedulin, when those two were inhibited, you see a reduction of nanoparticle transport across lymphatic endothelial cells. So this to us suggested that uh, macropinocytosis here is not involved, but you have multiple mechanisms that are used by the cell to transport particles. Now, when we looked at this uh, with our lower peg density particles, we actually saw some interesting differences. 
So we found that here, similar to the densely pegylated particles, you have paracellular transport and micropinocytosis that's reduced when you add the transport inhibitors. But here for these particles, for the less densely pegylated particles, you also can see um, that there's a reduction in, in macropinocytosis. So if you inhibit macropinocytosis, you get fewer and nanoparticles transported across the lymphatic endothelial cells. So this indicates that there's definitely a surface chemistry dependent mechanism that's happening here. Now we were curious, is this all the same depending on the size as well? Um, so we would expect that probably, yeah, you're gonna have similar mechanisms, but what we found is actually really interesting. So you can definitely still see the same effect in terms of micropinocytosis and paracellular transport. So you see a reduction in those, but with amylaride, so this is our macropinocytosis inhibitor, we actually found that when you have a densely pegylated 40 nanometer particle, now you also see a reduction in transport when you inhibit macropinocytosis. And you don't see as much of a reduction. You know, there's maybe a little bit and some of these individual time points are significantly different, but it's, it's not nearly as drastic as with the 100 nanometer particles of those less densely pegylated particles. Um, so there's re really something interesting going on here with respect to both surface chemistry and size in terms of what's going on with the macropinocytosis. And so just to recap, get everybody on the same page, you, with um, 40 nanometer particles, high density of PEG, you have macropinocytosis, micropinocytosis, and paracellular transport. With low PEG, you just have micropinocytosis and paracellular transport. With 100 nanometer particles here, you have micropinocytosis and paracellular transport with those high densi density pegylated particles. And with the low density pegylated particles, you have macropinocytosis, micropinocytosis, and paracellular transport. So one of the big questions we have at the moment is what's going on with macropinocytosis, right? We'd expect that the surface chemistry is probably the main driving factor, but it seems to be that the trends are actually kind of opposite depending on the size of the particle with respect to the surface chemistry. And so macropinocytosis is rather complex and it actually often is initiated by some initial binding to a receptor on the cell. So this can be um, initiated through things like albumin, but also you know, PDGFR, uh, EGFR. There's a lot of different receptors that will start to activation of macropinocytosis. And so we've been trying to understand what is driving some of these differences and knowing that Clearly, protein interactions with the cell are what drives activation of macropinocytosis. We started thinking about, well, what happens to particles when you stick them in a solution with protein in it? Well, what happens to them is that the proteins start absorbing to the surface. And so any material, including a nanoparticle that you put in a physiological environment with proteins in it is going to form, and in the case of a particle, we refer to this as a protein corona. So there's essentially a coating of proteins on the nanoparticle surface, and that can be affected by a variety of things. And also that protein corona can actually affect um, how the nanoparticle interacts with its environment. So for instance, um, it can affect colloidal stability, it can affect the stealth properties, so whether or not the immune system can detect the particle, it can affect opsonization, so again, activation of the inflammatory response, which would cause phagocytosis and removal of the particle. So there's a lot of things that can be influenced by this protein corona. And so we initially just sought out to do some, you know, this is more or less fresh off, uh, off the lab uh, data, where we're starting to look at, well, what happens in both cases in terms of size and then also surface chemistry to the proteins on their surface. And so we did an incubation with just FBS. So this is a conglomerate of a whole bunch of different proteins and then also just albumin by itself. And it's, you know, we're starting to see some interesting effects where definitely when you have a um, albumin coating, there's maybe a little bit of a trend that you have more albumin actually absorbing onto the surface when you have an R over D of less than four. Um, so these are your less densely pegylated particles. Uh, when you get this mixture in terms of the total protein content, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference. Um, so we're really starting to think about, okay, well, albumin is a really key player here. Maybe this is part of the difference between all of these. Um, but 
you know, the key thing here is we still have a lot of work to do in trying to figure out what are actually the proteins that are on these surfaces. And so one of the things in trying to think about this problem that we were starting to think about is, is how do we make this more physiologically relevant, right? What's happening in the body? How are the particles, like what kind of microenvironment are they really interacting with? And so we started thinking about, well, when we inject a particle, it's going to be in lymph fluid or lymph is more similar to like interstitial fluid. And so how does the lymph or interstitial fluid affect nanoparticle transport into lymphatics um, and also the proteins that are actually on the surface of the, of the particles? And so we're fortunate enough um, to have a collaborator who has access to lymphatic exudate samples uh, from patients. And so the way that these were obtained is essentially these were um, melanoma patients that had their lymph nodes removed. And so when you remove a lymph node, that leads to the lymphatic fluid basically just dumping into the region where the lymph node used to be. Lymphatics are a little bit slow in terms of growing. So revascularization with lymphatic vessels takes some time. And so when that happens, when you have the lymph node taken out, the patients actually have shunts placed to remove the fluid so that they don't end up with edema in a region, right? So the clinician that was doing this work essentially had these shunts and was collecting the fluid from the shunts. So this is called lymphatic exudate because it's not exactly lymph that was collected from a lymph vessel. It's a little bit messier than just pure lymph, um, as in that it probably contains interstitial fluid along with lymph. Right, so it's a little bit of a mix of both of those. But the really interesting thing that was shown previously is that these samples, and so this is, these are the samples that we're working with, really have a dramatically diff different protein signature. And so when you look here, and, and this is you know, published work, it, this is plasma compared to lymph um, fluid uh, of the same patients. You can really appreciate that there is a significant enrichment in, in a number of proteins here and a reduction in some other proteins uh, compared to what's found in plasma. So lymphatic exudate and so lymph most likely has a rather different composition of proteins and plasma. So this is one of the things we're starting to, to try to understand, okay, how are those proteins really going to affect our transport into lymphatic vessels? And so we've started doing a little bit of these experiments. Um, this is data from, I don't know, maybe a week or two ago, uh, where we started actually looking at how the protein corona, when we allow those particles to incubate in lymphatic exudate, and then put them into our in vitro model system to look at transport, do we see a difference in transport based on just the lymphatic exudate? Do we still see the same differences uh, with the different particle formulations? And in a nutshell, when you have PEG being pre-incubated on PEG, exudate didn't seem to make a whole lot of a difference, at least not initially. You still see the same trends. You can appreciate here, right? The, the um, graph, uh, the axis on the, on the Y here is a little bit of a different scale depending on which particle system you're looking at. So you've got your high density pegylated particles have the most transport compared to low density pegylated particle. But kind of interestingly, for the polystyrene particles, so these are really, really hydrophobic, um, highly negatively charged particles. When we pre-incubated those in the lymphatic exudate, you do actually see an increase in transport of these particles. So maybe even if you're working with formulations that you know, are not pegylated, if you get the right protein pre-incubation, you could enhance the transport of these particles into lymphatic vessels. Now, we also were really interested to, to try to understand, okay, so transport is the same, but what about things like uptake? And so really interestingly, we saw that when we incubate those particles with exudate, we see a reduction in uptake. So you can see in both the low density pegylated and the high density pegylated particles, there's a reduction in uptake um, at, so this is at, I think, 24 hours um, in, in those particles compared to the ones that were just in media. And so there's a lot of questions. Like I said, this data is, is you know, my grad student just collected this like in the last couple of weeks. Um, so we're still asking a lot of questions about what's going on here. Um, so, you know, what happens when there's no protein at all? All of these experiments were done in tissue culture media, which has for lymphatic endothelial cells about 2% FBS. So you still have some additional proteins around, but what happens when we just have the proteins from the lymphatic exudate? 
What happens when there's no protein at all? What if we just put the particle on those lymphatic endothelial cells without any protein coding? Is the transport then still going to be the same? Are there differences in the proteins that are absorbed onto the surface of these different nanoparticle formulations and also with respect to size? So still lots and lots of questions that we need to answer, um, but hopefully I've at least convinced you that dense pegylation is really beneficial for transporting nanoparticles into lymphatic vessels. Um, but both peg density and nanoparticle size modulate the transport mechanisms used by lymphatic endothelial cells to get nanoparticles into the lymphatic vessels. And the protein corona is one of the things we're exploring as maybe a cause for some of those differences. All right, so moving on, moving down downstream sort of from the lymphatic vessels to the lymph node. So Anne um, is one of the other PhD students in the lab, uh, has been really interested in trying to understand lymph node architecture and interstitial tissue. And so lymph nodes are really important because they help coordinate adaptive immunity. And the lymph node is highly organized. So for those of you who have a little less uh, immunology knowledge than, than some others, uh, you essentially have regions where you have lots of T cells and then regions where you have lots of B cells. B cells are your cells that make antibodies. T cells are your adaptive immune cells that essentially venture out into the tissue and kill things that shouldn't be there, whether that's a cancer cell or an infected cell or a virus or a bacteria. And so these, yes, um, so these, sorry, I get excited and then I start talking fast. Uh, so these, uh, B and T cells are what forms your main adaptive immune response. And these are essentially educated within the lymph nodes. So they're being basically being taught what material to respond to, what antigen to respond to. And if they find the right antigen, then they become activated in the lead lymph node and so on. And this process is highly coordinated, which means that the lymph node has really very specific architecture. And so these complex architectures, this is a diagram I find is always a little bit easier to appreciate all of the different facets. So you've got your B cell follicles that, um, and, and your T cell regions that are essentially surrounded by a capsid that is called the medullary or the sinuses, essentially. The, the bottom one is the medullary sinuses. You also have the subcapsular sinus. And all of those are actually lymphatic vessels. And so you've got lymphatic vessels that transport things to the lymph node. And then there is a barrier here. So there are um, antigen presenting cells that will take material up and transport it into those regions of those B and T cells. Materials can also go in through what's called the conduit system. So this is almost like a vessel-like, but not really a vessel system um, that connects the different regions within the lymph node. You've also got high endothelial venules. So those are specialized blood vessels that are within the lymph nodes where the immune cells will actually migrate into the, the lymph node that way. And people have thought of various different ways to take advantage of some of these processes. So targeting particles to the high endothelial venules to get them transported across and into those B and T cell regions within the lymph node. And there's also some more recent studies that have shown that antibodies are able to be uh, transcytosed across these sinuses as well and get into um, the lymph node interstitium. So I, I'm sure there'll be more and more pathways that we can come up to actually get particle systems into that interstitial area. But so we became really interested in trying to understand, well, what does that interstitium even look like? What is the pore size? There's a lot of cells in the lymph nodes. And so a lot of the work that has been done has really focused on trying to just stain for extracellular matrix and then say, based on that, these are our pores. But when we're thinking about drug delivery and nanoparticles, that pore size you know, is filled with cells. So there's additional things that are stopping the particles from just diffusing through 30 micron uh, pores. And so we started thinking about, well, how can we model this? How can we even try to understand some of this? And so we uh, learned from a lab at UVA, these tissue slice culture systems. And so essentially what you can do here is you can take a tissue out of an animal and then live slice it. So this tissue is you know, freshly excised. You embed it in agarose 
slice it into three to 500 micron thick slices, and then you can actually culture these tissues um, for 24 to 48 hours for most tissues. For the lymph node, that's about um, the length that we will go. You can stain them also. So this is a live stain where we stain for B cells and also for T cells um, to try to understand where within the lymph node you actually are. And we combine this method with one of the techniques that we use um, for actually um, you know, characterizing uh, any sort of um, really hydrogel, uh, but also for trying to, to see how do we get through barriers. And that's called multiple particle tracking. So we use nanoparticles to essentially assess, you can use this to do microbiology, so to assess structure, but also it's really helpful in understanding is your particle gonna get stuck in the tissue where you want it to get places where you maybe actually wanted to diffuse. And so what we do here is we take those slices, we then put particles on them, and we essentially watch them diffuse. So there's just Brownian motion, and then we can track the centroids of those particles for three to 10 seconds and extrapolate and extract the mean squared displacement of those particles, assuming that it's just two-dimensional transport. Now, one of the really important things for this is um, that you can't do this when the particle's stuck, right? If you want to use this for microbiology and trying to understand what are the biophysical properties of the tissue, the particle's stuck, well, then there's no diffusion to measure. So then you can't extrapolate anything. So the first step that we did was to try to see if we can make a particle system that will diffuse in the lymph node interstitial tissue. This is important both for drug delivery and also for characterization. And so we found, again, we, we turned to our uh, polystyrene particles um, and pegylated them mid-layer, mid uh, sorry, mid mushroom conformation, um, and then also dense uh, peg coating. And we found that when we have the dense peg coating, we get um, pretty good diffusion of those particles within, of course, you know, it's ECM and cells and so on. So it's a little bit stunted compared to if you were doing this just in water. And we found that this holds true no matter what region you're in. So in the B cell and T cell zones, you get better diffusion of the particles when they're densely pegylated compared to just having a little bit of peg on them. And we can quantify this further and actually look at kind of the distribution. So for 100 nanometer particles, the B and the T cell zone really was very similar um, for across the board, actually, 100 nanometer, 200, 500 nanometer particles. Um, so all of them were diffusing quite well throughout the lymph node. Now we can use this information and that mean square displacement to extrapolate the pore size also of the region. And so usually, like I mentioned before, what people have done is they actually have stained for podoplanin, which will stain those um, vessel-like structures that are throughout the lymph node. So that's where a lot of your ECM deposition is going to be and extrapolated pore size based on that. When you extrapolate pore size just on ECM basis and, and on basis of uh, this network, you get something like around 30 microns, you know, somewhere between 10 and 50 is what's reported in the literature. So average about 30. Uh, but when we did this with our nanoparticle systems, we actually found that the pores, when you have cells present, so a complete tissue, not just the extracellular matrix, the pore size is closer to somewhere between 600 to about a micron um, in size. And that's, again, doesn't matter whether you're in the B cell zone or the T cell zone. Now, we also became really interested in trying to understand, you know, how does this, does this actually hold true for all lymph nodes? We were mostly at this point working with skin draining lymph nodes. And we were curious, well, what about the mesentery lymph nodes, right? So those drain from a different compartment. So they're gonna see a lot of different things. The skin draining lymph nodes tend to be, you know, non-inflamed unless you have a scratch or something like that. But the mesentery lymph nodes, the gut draining lymph nodes, they're constantly exposed to things and they actually provide what's called a tolerogenic environment, right? You don't want to constantly react to all the microbes, your microbiome that lives in your gastrointestinal tract. So they actually have kind of a, this tolerogenic environment in those lymph nodes. So we know we've got a mostly uninflamed lymph node and then a lymph node that has this unique specialized environment. And so we asked, is this true for all lymph nodes, this kind of diffusion? Is, are there any differences that we can see? 
And really interestingly, we actually found that nanoparticle diffusion seemed to be slightly reduced in those mesentery lymph nodes compared to the skin draining lymph nodes. We honestly had no idea what we were expecting. Um, so it was great that we even found something that was different. And so now we're starting to think about, well, well what is going on here? Um, and, and also trying to understand, okay, well, when we're comparing some of these, um, you know, you see a little bit of the difference and it seems to vary also by particle. So trying to think a little bit more about pore size as well here. And so when we extracted the pore size, and there's a reason why I'm showing you all of these dots, the pore size is directly related to the diffusion coefficient. So you can see that there are some decreases, but you can also see that there's a lot of variability both in the diffusion coefficient and also the pore size here. So we're starting to think about, oh, okay, so there's a lot of differences here. Just this is, so each individual point is a data point per mouse. And for each mouse, we collected at least two lymph nodes and more than 100 particles were tracked. So lots and lots of particle data here. Um, but when we zone in on what is going on in individual mice, we started seeing there's a lot of heterogeneity between these mice. Um, so this is really curious, especially considering that mice that we work with in the lab are usually clones. So they're genetically extremely similar, um, but we're still seeing a huge heterogeneity here. Um, just, you know, same particle, same size, same type of lymph node, but there seem to be some distributions that are happening that we're starting to, to try to understand where is this heterogeneity coming from. And one of the hypotheses that we have is that it's maybe also related to extracellular matrix and how much of ECM there is. And so there's some really interesting work that has come out recently about how extracellular matrix actually affects T cell motility in the lymph node. And so you can appreciate these are um, comparing young and aged mice. So these are mice that are maybe about two to three months in age, and these ones are probably 12 to 13 months in age. And so you can really appreciate that the kind of uh, light blue here, this is a second harmonic generation. So it's mostly collagen fibers. And so you have not a ton of collagen in those younger lymph nodes, but as the mice age, you get collagen deposition and extracellular matrix deposition in the lymph nodes. And this actually causes, or this is correlated with a reduction in the mean velocity, so the speed of migration of the T cells, as well as the straightness of their path. And the really interesting thing to us was that when you actually look being closer, so proximal to ECM rich regions compared to distal, so further away from ECM rich regions. In the east, closer to ECM rich regions, you also have a reduction in uh, motility of those T cells. So, this is really telling us that doing some of this characterization and trying to understand what are the biophysical properties of these different compartments of the lymph node has biological relevance and would be really interesting to try to understand well, what is going on here in these aged mice in terms of the interstitial tissue. So we have, again, data that is totally brand new, um, as in my student sent me this data like two days ago. Um, in mice that are aged, they're not as aged as the mice from those studies on the T cells. So these mice are about five months old compared to the younger mice that are about two months old. And we're seeing really striking differences in the diffusion of those nanoparticles within um, the skin draining lymph nodes. So these are the young mice skin draining lymph nodes, this is older mice skin draining lymph nodes, and then same with the mesentery lymph nodes. There's some striking differences in diffusion across these. Of course, at this point, we're at like two to three mice, and we've still got plenty more work to do um, to make this really robust, but it's at least giving us an indication that maybe some of that lymph node accumulation that happens as uh, we age is actually affecting the interstitial tissue and also affect the ECM accumulation is affecting those biophysical properties. And this will affect drug delivery, right? If we don't think about how do we get across these barriers for drug delivery, then we've, we've got a little bit of a problem. We won't be able to get the drug to where it needs to be. And so, you know, similarly, if we extrapolate that diffusion coefficient, you can appreciate there is a decrease uh, in the aged mice for both the mesentery and the skin draining lymph nodes here as well. And so with that, hopefully I've convinced you that uh, you can use these densely pegylated nanoparticles to probe interstitial tissue spaces in the lymph node.
uh, the extracellular matrix spaces seem to differ between different lymph node locations. So maybe also depending on the lymph node response, it's one of the things that we're now investigating is actually trying to see if we inflame these lymph nodes with different types of adjuvants, so different materials that are actually used in vaccines also do help elicit an immune response. These actually will cause different types of immune responses, depending on what adjuvant you're using. Some of them also are a stronger response, some of them less strong. So we're really curious to see how all of that affects lymph node architecture. And so we'll be using our, our nanoparticle system that we developed here to try to probe some of those um, ECM and interstitial tissue of the lymph node in those different conditions um, and try to make a little bit of sense, maybe also of some of the heterogeneity that we're seeing. And yeah, hopefully I've convinced you that there's a lot of variability, also a lot of heterogeneity between mice. Um, so I think, you know, as engineers, we like to simplify and, and narrow things down. But I think a lot of the fields, especially in, in extracellular matrix related, is starting to move towards saying, OK, well, you know, maybe we'll just not work with only a collagen gel, but we'll start recombining things now that we've done some of that that homework essentially as a field with just single uh, constituent gels. And, and so, you know, we're really starting to think about, okay, well, maybe we need to introduce some of the heterogeneity to be able to answer some of the questions um, of what is actually going on in vivo a little bit in, in more detail. Um, and with that, I think I'm not going to talk about the last one, um, just because I want to have some time for questions for you guys. Uh, so I'll just skip ahead to more nanoparticles, as you can see. Uh, uh, I'll just skip ahead to, to my acknowledgments. All of this would not be possible without my fantastic lab. Um, so Jake and Anne were the two graduate students really spearheading the work that I presented to you. But then also we've got a whole host of collaborators at this point, lab alumni, um, and of course also our funding sources. And with that, I'm happy to take any of your questions. Getting in here. I think we need to we need to share this. Questions from the audience. Not yet, not yet. Not yet. Okay. This is a Hollywood <laughs> production. All right. Squid. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, really fantastic. I really enjoy it. Uh, before we go to the questions, I would like to call um, Oh, I need a seat to um, start all over again. Well, thanks very much, Professor Mazel, for fantastic presentations. And before we get into the question and answer, we uh, like to call everyone's attention to our next hybrid seminar, which will take place not next week. If you come next week, you'll be disappointed. Uh, there'll be no seminar next week. But on March 3rd, with Vicky Coleman from uh, Brown University going to visit us. And uh, please join us. And then also next week, okay. Also next week, uh, please join us virtually on Thursday. We have our uh, annual uh, engineering medicine symposium. It's going to be fantastic, I promise you. Uh, please follow us on social media and receive the latest update. You can also see our social media information on the slides. And you can always access the registration information for our BME seminar on our website. So we'll have some questions to go through. And let's go with the in person. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to repeat the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to repeat the question to everybody in here. Um, so the question was on if clathrin is one of the proteins that is going to coat the nanoparticles and to help them get transcytosed across lymphatic endothelial cells. And so I honestly, I don't know if there is clathrin, but in general, for clathrin mediated endocytosis, right? We haven't done proteomics yet. That's kind of our next step. We're in the process of getting there, hopefully in a couple months proteomics. 
Um, so yeah, so trying to get actually the, the full array of, of proteins that are on those particles. Um, but in general, for clathrin mediate endocytosis, the clathrin is actually on the surface of the cell and helps mediate the invagination of those vesicles for micropinocytosis, right? For micropinocytosis, the vessel uh, or the vesicles are kind of formed by essentially the cell making a, you know, an, an inward vesicle. Uh, Macrophonocytosis is different because it's like the cell is engulfing whatever is on the outside. Um, yeah, so that's what the clathrin is doing here. Sure. Any other questions from the students? Otherwise, I'll go to the online question. So don't be shy. <laughs> we'll come back. Okay. So the online question is. Um, are the mucosal tissue barriers part of the architecture of the lymph nodes? Um, the mucosal tissue, well, <laughs> that's a complex question. Uh, so if you, it depends on how you, where you draw the end of the mucosal tissue, right? So as somebody thinks about the immune system, I consider the lymph node that is draining that or that is collecting material that's drained from a specific tissue to be kind of part of that architecture. Um, and I certainly think, at least based on also what we've seen with looking at skin versus mesenterial lymph nodes, that there is differences in terms of what gets transported to those lymph nodes that comes from the mucosal tissue that's going to affect lymph node architecture. Um, so, so there's definitely some correlation there. I think maybe they're not traditionally thought to be part of the mucosal system, but really lymph nodes are... A, broad system in the body, they're everywhere and they drain from everywhere. But I do think that, you know, the local lymph nodes are kind of considered somewhat part of the system as well. Actually, I have a question, unless someone else has one. Okay, so um, my question just, so vaccines are an obvious thing to put on the nanoparticles and because you want them to go to the lymph node, yep. right? But um, do these nanoparticles also get into the bloodstream? And are there other drugs that are yeah with, with uh, nanoparticles for? So that's a really great question, actually. So I didn't talk about the gut draining lymph. Um, so in the intestinal tract, actually, all of your lipids are absorbed via lymphatic vessels. Um, so lipids get packaged into what's called chylomicrons, which are basically bodily nanoparticles. Um, and then once they get in across the epithelium, they're transported into lymphatic vessels that are called the lacteals that are in each of the villi um, of the lymphatic, uh, of, of the gastrointestinal tract. So there is actually a very large field also on designing drugs that have lipid tails, for instance, to take advantage of lymphatic transport. Because when you get into lymphatics from the gut, you don't have hepatic first pass metabolism. So normally everything, you know, if you take a pill orally, that drug gets into your bloodstream, that bloodstream is first going to carry the drug to the liver, where a lot of it gets digested. And so a lot of it is usable. So it reduces essentially the bioavailability of that drug. But if you get it into the lymphatic vessel, you don't have to worry about that so much because the lymphatic vessels dump into the thoracic duct region. So it's closer to the heart, closer to the lungs, where it then first gets transported everywhere in the body. So this is one of the reasons why we're trying to understand all of these barriers is exactly this. If we can hijack the mechanism in the gut, then we can potentially deliver drugs um, and shield them in the gastric environment as well to the gut lymphatics and, and be able to increase bioavailability quite significantly. Nice. <laughs> yeah, Katherine. Yeah, so if you are just curious, if you repeat your experiments uh, in the vascular and the cell, how the results will be different? Yeah, so obviously we, we haven't quite done that. Um, but I think in general, right, so the, I, I don't, I also don't know how much sense it makes to do the comparison, because we're talking, right, so, so these, um, one of the things that at least for lymphatic endothelial cells, I'm a lymphatics expert, I'm not a blood endothelial cell expert, um, for lymphatic endothelial cells, it's been shown that there is a difference in terms of which direction you go. So there's directionality to the transport. And so if you flip the vessel, which would be more indicative of what we think about transport out of the blood vessel, we haven't done those experiments, but 
when you do it with just some, some basic dextrans and proteins, there are actually differences in how much material gets transported. So I don't know how translational those would be, um, just because you're also, you know, when you're talking about, yeah, when you're talking about things in the bloodstream, you're also thinking about, you know, getting the particle to the actual endothelial cells. Certainly, there is a lot of work that has shown that pegylation is important in preventing those particles to just get cleared by macrophages and other monocytes that are in your bloodstream, right? Any particulate that they can recognize that is foreign, um, all of those antigen presenting cells, um, those immune cells will start to eat to make sure that nothing's infecting you, right? Because we're, we're talking about things that are virus sized. Um, so these are normally things where your body goes, ooh, this is not good. We should be getting rid of this. So last question from the audience. Now I need to push him out to you and ask the question. Wow. You need to ask him more questions. Okay. So we do have one. Uh, this will be the last question because we're almost to noon. But uh, so there's one more online, which is an uh, interesting talk. Why are the nanoparticles being taken up by cells, you know, in transcytosis? Why are they not swept away with extracellular fluid straight into the lymph? So we're trying to understand a little bit more about how that transport is actually happening. So there's a lot of postulation about what happens in initial capillaries. Um, the initial capillaries are... Um, less tight than, for instance, a collecting vessel. I didn't talk about all of these differences. So essentially in, in lymphatic vessels, just like in blood vessels, we have capillaries, we have larger collecting vessels. And so in those initial vessels, there is a hypothesis that when there is interstitial fluid, that the um, cells will essentially be somewhat pulled apart. And some of that will also drive particulate transport into lymphatic vessels. It's just, we don't have any good models for that. And it's really hard to study lymphatic vessels in vivo as well. Um, so we're getting to those questions. We're starting to, um, and we've done some experiments in vitro actually, where we've put a pressure head. So essentially pushing fluid across lymphatic endothelial cells, and we're seeing a drastic increase in transport. But interestingly, the, the kind of effect of needing at least some peg, that remains even with those um, added um, at pressure, uh, I guess pressure-driven flow across lymphatic endothelial cells. But that's a really great question, and it's topic of active investigation from actually multiple grad students in the lab. Great, that's uh, all the time uh, and we have. Thanks, uh, Professor Mazo again. And see you next Thursday for Engineering Medicine Symposium and March 3rd for the BM seminar. Thank you. Thank you.